In this video, we're going to explore the story of Futonga Sissoko and his mind-boggling heist involving the theft of a staggering $242 million, using nothing more than his intellect and an illusion of real black magic. We're going to delve into the details of his elaborate scheme, exploring the intricate planning, execution, and aftermath of one of the most infamous financial crimes in modern history. There's not a lot known about his childhood and upbringing. The only remaining records say that he was born in Dabia, Mali. He was born into an average, poor Malian family with many siblings, so even since childhood he was already familiar with social and economic problems. He always strove to be an exceptional student, and his natural proclivities for learning definitely allowed him to do that. He realized that, with his ever-growing knowledge, in the future, he could become a truly powerful and wealthy man who could help everyone around him. Having lived in a big family in poor conditions, he possessed invaluable experience in socializing with others, wanting to be independent and finally get out of the conditions he was in. This was the beginning of his path to becoming even more opportunistic, a better manipulator, and a financially able adult. He never would have thought that applying these knowledge and skills would make him one of the richest businessmen of his time, through only his intellect, charisma, and a little bit of mysticism. After years of higher education and success in the business industry, he was one of the bank managers, now had a better life, and was able to support his family. He often looked back at his life and was content with what he had and achieved, but he also remembered his dreams from childhood that he wanted to become an even more powerful and influential figure with lots of money. He then decided that he wanted something more. He felt an extreme rush of enthusiasm and motivation. He believed that he could achieve anything if he only wanted to. His unprecedented sharp intellect and advanced social skills would become his tools for the ultimate success and achievement of his goal. He knew that for his aspirations to come true, he needed new ground, a new level of power, money, and influence. His eye fell on Dubai since, even to this day, this has been one of the wealthiest places on earth. He realized that this was it, the place for his goals to come to fruition. Since he has already been in the banking industry, he knew that the biggest bank in Dubai was Dubai Islamic Bank. His social skills and work experiences with Arabic clients helped him formulate possible ways of moving forward with his plans and using their cultural aspects to his benefit. This was the time when he began developing his detailed plan of action to overpower the world of finances, influence, and power. He was prepared to the teeth, and so he finally ventured to Dubai. Upon arrival, he quickly began working on his perceived high status and appearance. He reserved a residency in the Dubai Hotel to add to his appearance of wealthiness and importance. After establishing himself as a respected and clearly successful businessman, he went into the Dubai Bank to start the game. He knew that the Arabic people, with their rich culture and ancient history, were very much influenced by mysticism. They truly believed in jinns, spirits, and, for the lack of a better term, magical or supernatural powers. His country also had a rich history and ancient traditions regarding magic and spiritual practices, so this was definitely one of his additional strengths understanding mysticism and how to apply this knowledge. He went straight to the main branch and requested to meet the manager of the bank. This was one of the psychological tricks to make him look even more important and confident in himself. No one expected such behavior, but they complied since he seemed to be a real VIP. The manager was Muhammad Ahab, and he asked to know the purpose of the request. To begin his plan, he made the first move by asking to receive a big loan for a vehicle. This was surprising to Muhammad, since usually they interact with someone from the area, someone whom they are already familiar with. But nevertheless, Suzuko's wealthy and confident display did its job, and he successfully made the deal. He used another psychological trick known as make a request to establish trust. When you ask someone for something and they cooperate, they begin to unconsciously trust you as someone they know and with whom they have already interacted. But yes, will definitely come in handy later. Sissoko proceeds forward, and invites Muhammad into his suite for dinner as a gesture of gratitude. And most importantly, he adds that he will additionally show him something incredible from his culture that will amaze him. Muhammad's interest and curiosity were intrigued, so he agreed. 
In the evening, Muhammad came to Sissoko's suite, and after some initial preparation and ice-breaking small talk, Sissoko finally invited him to a special room. Well, inside it was darkness and smoke. It was intimidating and yet enticing. Muhammad couldn't resist. After closing the door, the smoke began clearing up, revealing numerous ancient ritualistic objects, such as candle holders with candles, different books with African inscriptions and ornaments on them, face masks representing different spirits, and so on. Sissoko astonished Muhammad by saying that he was a real sorcerer who could utilize black magic, communicate with spirits, and fulfill his dreams. And for Muhammad, he had a special proposition. He offered to show him how he can double any sum of money to prove that he's telling the truth. Muhammad was shocked and couldn't say anything. He had never seen or experienced anything like this. Sissoko used all of these ritualistic things and a very specific atmosphere to create an indelible impression on Muhammad and his efforts paid off. Since at that time, many people were raised in a superstitious environment, truly believing in spirits, ghosts, jinns, dark and light forces, and so on. They, like Muhammad, were very susceptible to such trickery, being honestly unable to distinguish reality from a clever illusion. Muhammad immediately called his assistants to bring him 100,000 dirhams, or about $25,000 from his personal safe, because he wanted to see the truth of Sisiko's words with his own eyes. They entered the apartment, and went straight into the dark room where Sissoko put the money in the center and began his magical ritual. The smoke began to thicken while Sissoko made ritualistic moves around the money, chanted words, carried candles over the money, and called for spirits to manifest. After that, voices were heard and strange silhouettes began appearing. Then Sissoko asked Muhammad to have the spirits take over the room area to finish the ritual. For this, they needed to go outside of the apartment and wait. As soon as they came out, the whole hotel ran out of electrical power and everything got dark. The weather outside was stormy that night, with heavy rain, wind, and even lightning, which caused an additional mystifying effect. After a while, Muhammad couldn't hold himself anymore. So Sissoko then, after the electricity was restored, went inside first to confirm that the ritual had been finished. He called Muhammad to come inside. While coming in, he saw strange lights and heard noises behind the door. But once he came inside, amid a dark room with dim candles and smoke, he saw his money which was indeed double the amount. While he was taking the money, he couldn't believe his eyes, and Sissoko told him, see, that wasn't a joke. The whole situation got Muhammad on the hook. He was completely convinced, and his hunger for money grew more and more. Sissoko, of course, after achieving what he hoped for, made a deal offer to Muhammad that he would open a bank account on Sissoko's behalf and would transfer their money for further doubling. He eagerly agreed. Thus, the literal magical deal, worth millions of dollars, was made, and Sissoko would make sure to make the most of it in the future. The scheme was in action from 1995 to 1998. During this time, Muhammad would make a whopping 183 overall transfers of the bank's money to Sissoko's account the total sum of which would amount to $242 million. To this day, no one knows why Muhammad continued to transfer the funds, even though no money has ever been doubled or returned. Among the most known speculations are, some people literally thought that Sissoko used actual, real magic on Muhammad to take over his mind and control him, as if by hypnosis. Others believe that the basic, sunk cost mentality was at play. When a person has already put lots of money, time, and effort into something, which causes them to keep going mindlessly and stubbornly, rather than admitting that they were wrong or mistaken, this certainly might have been a reason. Or maybe, in addition to everything else, Muhammad was just taken for his human weaknesses, such as his basic desire for more and lack of long-term consideration. Although we will not be able to get the final answer, we can still count on all of the different aspects of the situation and human psychological predispositions and weaknesses. And also, one of the most important questions among the bank workers, executives, and investigators is, how was it even possible for such a huge scheme to go on unnoticed for such a long time? This quandary still is truly baffling. So Sissoko's future activity would be considered surprising and mind-boggling to everyone involved in the investigation of the case. After finishing the deal with Muhammad and guaranteeing his almost unlimited budget, he went back to his home village in Mali and spent some time there. 
similarly to many other ones in that area. Debia was a small and poor village where native people had to do hard manual labor just to survive. So out of compassion for his people and ambitions regarding his place of origin, he began his first philanthropic activity. He gave the citizens money, food, clothes, and other things so that they could live somewhat more comfortably and not worry about their survival. He even created some profitable projects for attracting travelers and business investors to transform this poor land into an attractive, green, modernized place for foreign travelers and other visitors that could produce profit, thus making the local economy stronger and more stable. As a result, everyone loved and respected Sissoko and even came up with a nickname for him, Babasora. After some time in his homeland, he decided to continue the move. This was happening around 1996. His eye fell on the U.S., specifically New York City. There, he imagined achieving his future goals of increasing his wealth, power, and influence even more. And there's no better place for that than the U.S. While his magically acquired finances kept coming in, he was prepared to explore completely new possibilities on the other side of the globe. After arriving in New York, he went to Citibank, one of the largest banks in that area. Surprisingly, his first actions seemingly weren't connected with increasing his wealth, but rather finding a wife. With his influence and prosperity, he definitely wouldn't have any problems finding someone. So, unsurprisingly, he managed to win over one of the managers of Citibank into marrying him. What is even more interesting is that in his traditional African culture, it is permissible to have multiple wives, and sometimes it's even encouraged to be able to show your masculinity and wealth. The woman he married knew about his other wives from different parts of the world, but still agreed to the marriage. As the investigation later revealed, his female partner was helping him with money transactions from Dubai to the US, specifically to his new bank account. According to the records, he managed to transfer over $100 million. So no wonder he was able to find an accomplice. And since it was happening in the major bank of that time, no one noticed anything suspicious. As recorded in the official court document, in the legal case of the Islamic Bank and Citibank, in the period from 2005 to 2008, he made transactions amounting to $151 million, from which $500,000 were paid to his wife. After finally settling in America and establishing his money scheme, he reached his goal of a perfect life. Lots of money, expensive clothes, cars, apartments, and even multiple wives. He spent his money on anything he wanted. He even fulfilled his dream of opening an airline, which he named after his village, Air Dabia. For this reason, he purchased a Hawker Siddeley 125, a personal plane, and a pair of Boeing 727s with a capacity of 180 passengers each. Still, after all this time, he never forgot about his home village. He still continued to support his family and other villagers, who very much relied on him. Every time he came to visit them, everyone would gather around and bring him flowers and other little presents. Around him, people were always smiling and children were happy because he always brought some toys and other things to share with everyone generously. Even the neighboring villages were benefiting from his good deeds. He was considered almost like a royalty figure there, and yet still approachable, kind, and helpful. Unfortunately, the perfect life couldn't continue indefinitely. One day in July 1996, he made a serious mistake. He tried to purchase two old military helicopters from the time of the Vietnam War for, as he said, making them into an emergency air ambulance. But since these were still considered to be gunships, they required a special export license. While trying to go through customs, Sisako's assistants tried to speed up the process and made an offer to bribe an officer with $30,000. Unfortunately, they got arrested instead which caused Interpol to issue a warrant for Sissoko's arrest as well. Since he wasn't in the U.S. at that time, Interpol issued an additional international warrant to find him. Eventually, he was found and arrested in Geneva and kept in Champ Dolan prison. After being arrested and awaiting further investigation in the U.S., he immediately hired American lawyers to represent him in court. One of such lawyers was Thomas Spencer, who was his leading attorney. Sissoko was extradited to Miami, where before his hearing he had begun to prepare and activate his influential supporters. Well, the readiness of his diplomatic supporters shocked the judge working on his case. As the judge noted, he has never seen so many diplomats in a courtroom before. Every diplomat gave their testimonies that Sasaka was a respected and even admired person who helped those whom he could very generously. His lawyer and supporters managed to make such a strong case that even though the U.S. government wanted Sasaka held in custody, he was bailed for $20 million. After his successful release from prison, he felt an extreme impulse toward generosity. He rewarded every member of his defense team, including Thomas Spencer, with seven expensive cars. Spencer and others were very surprised and puzzled by his behavior, 
since everything they had done was to help him go out for bail while he still awaited his final trial in Miami. During that time, as was reported by those associated with him, he went on an unlimited spending spree. He visited every expensive jewelry, clothing, and other stores he could find, spending up to $500,000 in one go. A famous car dealer in Miami even said he would come in and buy two, three, or four cars at the same time, come back another week and do the same, and so on. It was like the money was just wind for him. Well, in total, he sold Sissoko around 40 cars. Soon he also turned to his romantic interests, marrying an additional 20 wives and housing them in 23 different apartments he rented all over the city. This whole deal kept going while Muhammad continued transferring Sissoko money. This was what allowed him to achieve his dream of a luxurious life. But surprisingly, he didn't stop spending money just on himself. They began boosting his reputation even further when he began doing humanitarian work and became a true Miami celebrity at that time. He was giving away large sums of money to help people around the city, the homeless, poor, sick. And since his trial was approaching, he probably understood the value of good publicity. One such example was when he visited one of the high schools in that area and donated a whopping $400,000 to a high school band for traveling to New York on a Thanksgiving Day parade. One of his other defense lawyers, H. Smith, even noted that on some random days he would drive around the city and just hand money to homeless people. By some estimates, he gave away around $14 million in those 10 months he was there. That's over a million dollars a month. Finally, in March 1997, when his court trial began, all of his lawyers unanimously advised him to deny the charges, especially because there was evidence, such as phone call records which showed Sissoko instructing everything to be according to the law. Regardless, despite his legal advice, he still decided to take the blame. Some theorized that this might have been an attempt to stop further investigation into his finances by confessing a lesser crime. Unfortunately, it didn't work. His sentence was only 43 days in prison and a $250,000 fine paid, of course, by the Dubai Islamic Bank without its knowledge. After admission to the prison and serving just half of the sentence, the federal court issued an exchange offer for Sissoko's early release and returned for a $1 million payment to a homeless shelter. He delightedly agreed. His remaining time was meant to be served as a home arrest, but instead he decided to go straight to his home in Mali and receive a hero's welcome by all the local people who met him with gratitude and excitement. Up until a year later, everything went smoothly. He was still playing a local celebrity by giving off his money to everyone in need and enjoying his life. But on one day, in March 2008, the Dubai Islamic Bank's superiors started noticing that something was wrong. Mohammed was getting more and more nervous each day, since Sisako even stopped taking his calls. Soon, he couldn't keep his secret anymore, so he confessed to a co-worker about everything. He had made a deal with an African sorcerer, who promised to double the transferred money by using black magic. Later, when this information got to the bank's authorities, he was asked how much he transferred being terrified and ashamed, he wrote the answer on a scrap of paper, saying 890 million dirhams, or 242 million US dollars. After a long and highly publicized court trial, Muhammad Ahab was found guilty of fraud and sentenced to three years in prison. There were also rumors that he was made to undergo an exorcism from the influence of black magic, which is possible considering the culture back then. What is interesting in the end is that the Dubai court, in Sisako's absence, issued him a sentence of three years of imprisonment for money laundering and practicing magic, and even Interpol issued an arrest warrant, which remained unfulfilled. Sissoko, for all these years up to 2014, was an active member of parliament in Mali, which guaranteed him complete immunity from prosecution. After retiring in 2014, he has still been protected by the fact that Mali didn't have any legal agreements or connections with any other country. He died peacefully in March 2021, at the age of approximately 80 years old. Even though he had to stay in his homeland for all these years without a possibility of ever leaving, he lived a surprisingly fulfilling life by transforming his once poor and primitive homeland into a modernized city with economic prospects and happier people, and by helping all whom he could throughout his journey, never being arrested for more than 20 days in his whole life, and never facing any legal consequences for his $242 million heist. He has been one of the most perplexing and fascinating cases to this day. This was the end of this captivating case with a truly unexpected ending. If you wish to see more videos like this one, consider liking and subscribing. If you have any suggestions, leave them in the comments below. See you in the next one.